Thank you very much. Uh, some of my titles may be good. I'm quite pleased with The Blind Watchmaker, as Ray Kurzweil has said. Um, the Selfish Gene is not a bad title, but it's unfortunately been rather widely read by title only. Uh, various critics have omitted to read the rather substantial footnote, which is the book itself. <laughs> this new book, uh, An Appetite for Wonder, uh, the subtitle is The Making of a Scientist. It is a memoir of the first half of my life, up to the age of 35, uh, and it culminates in the writing of The Selfish Gene. So there's going to be a volume two in two years' time. It was all supposed to have been one volume, but I kind of lost a bit of stamina halfway through and decided I needed a bit of positive reinforcement. <laughs> so I asked the publisher if I could split it in half and, uh, and pr produce it in two volumes. And so it is a actually a rather natural breakpoint. The Selfish Gene was a fairly natural breakpoint in my life. So I'm going to uh, go through with a, a set of readings kind of strung together with a bit of talk. Um, the book begins with ancestors and goes on to my childhood and school days. And I got one or two little anecdotes from school days which might be vaguely amusing. Um, I was sent to boarding schools uh, of a rather British kind uh, and rather young, actually. I was first sent to boarding school at the age of seven, which is a bit too young to be sent away to school. Uh, I used to have fantasies that the matron would turn into my mother. And um, I thought that since both of them had dark, curly hair, it wouldn't take too much of a miracle to, <laughs> to achieve that. Uh, so I'm going to read a little bit uh, about school days. I was an exceptionally untidy and disorganized little boy in my early years. My first school reports dwelt insistently on the theme of ink. Headmaster's report. He has produced some good work and well deserves his prize, a very inky little boy at present, which is apt to spoil his work. Latin. He has made steady progress, but unfortunately, when using ink, his, his written work becomes very untidy. Mathematics. He works very well, but I'm not always able to read his work. <laughs> he must learn that ink is for writing, not washing purposes. <laughs> Miss Benson, my elderly French teacher, somehow managed to omit the ink like motif, but even her report had a sting in the tail. French. Plenty of ability, a good pronunciation, and a wonderful facility in escaping work. <laughs> I then went on to another school, the secondary school, uh, and with, which was rather more um, Spartan in some ways. Um, and I uh, went through a religious phase, which I then abandoned, uh, and, went th and then became rather rebellious. And with a couple of friends, we refused to kneel down in chapel. And so everybody else was kneeling down with bowed heads. And we were sitting upright uh, like, like islands of rebellion. Um, the, it being an Anglican school, they were very decent and didn't take it out on us. We, but they, they didn't um, indoctrinate us or punish us in any way, um, which I think is a nice advertisement for the Anglican church. I hate to think what might have happened uh, if we'd been to a school run by a, a rival sect. <laughs> um, my housemaster... Mr. Ling did make a sort of an effort to reform me. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit here. I've only recently learned that my housemaster, Peter Ling, actually a nice man, if rather too conformist, telephoned Johan Thomas, my zoology master, to voice his concern about me. In a recent letter to me, Mr. Thomas reported that he warned Mr. Ling that, quote, requiring someone like you to attend chapel twice a day on Sunday was doing you positive harm. The phone went down without comment. Mr. Ling also summoned my parents for a heart-to-heart -heart talk over tea. That's what the way we do things in England. <laughs> About my rebellious behavior in chapel. I knew nothing of this at the time, and my mother has only just told me of the incident. Mr. Ling asked my parents to try to persuade me to change my ways. 
My father said, approximately by my mother's recollection, it's not our business to control him in that sort of way. That kind of thing is your problem. <laughs> and I'm afraid I must decline your request. My parents' attitude to the whole affair was that it wasn't important. <coughs> Mr. Ling, as I said, was in his way a decent man. A contemporary and friend of mine in the same house recently told me the following nice story. He was illicitly up in a dormitory during the day kissing one of the housemaids. The pair panicked when they heard a heavy tread on the stairs, and my friend hastily bundled the young woman up onto a windowsill and drew the curtains to hide her standing form. Mr. Ling came into the room and must have noticed that only one of the three windows had the curtains drawn. Even worse, my friend noticed to his horror that the girl's feet were clearly visible, <laughs> protruding under the curtain. He firmly believes that Mr. Ling must have realized what was going on, but pretended not to, perhaps on boys will be boys grounds. What are you doing up here in the dormitory at this hour? Just came up to change my socks, sir. <laughs> oh, well, hurry on down. Good call on Mr. Ling's part. That boy went on to become probably the most successful alumnus of his generation the knighted chief executive officer of one of the largest international corporations in the world, and a generous benefactor of the school, endowing, among other things, the Peter Ling Fellowship. <laughs> I don't mention the name in the book, but I can divulge to you that that boy was Sir Howard Stringer, who became the head of the, uh, of the Sony Corporation, the only non-Japanese to, to do so. I then went on to Oxford, which was, I think, the turning point in my life, really. Uh, it was wonderful to be educated to become a scholar and to think, rather than educated to just learn up what, what was in textbooks. And uh, so I think I owe a tremendous lot to the Oxford experience, and in particular to various mentors at Oxford, and um, especially one, Michael Cullen, who was the number two to Nico Tinbergen, the great ethologist, animal behaviorist, who later won a Nobel Prize. Nico Tinbergen was my official research supervisor as a graduate student, but Mike Cullen was the one who really uh, looked after me. And I want to read to you, and I hope I don't break down when I do so, I occasionally choke up a bit, um, the, uh, the eulogy that I wrote for him uh, in his, at his funeral. Uh, in one of the Oxford College chapels. He did not publish many papers himself, yet he worked prodigiously hard, both in teaching and research. He was probably the most sought-after tutor in the entire zoology department. The rest of his time, he was always in a hurry and worked a hugely long day, was devoted to research, but seldom his own research. Everybody who knew him has the same story to tell. All the obituaries told it in revealingly similar terms. You would have a problem with your research. You knew exactly where to go for help, and there he would be for you. I see the scene as yesterday, the lunchtime conversation in the kitchen, the wiry boyish figure in the red sweater, slightly hunched like a spring wound up with intense intellectual energy, sometimes rocking back and forth with concentration the deeply intelligent eyes, understanding what you meant even before the words came out, the back of the envelope to aid explanation, the occasionally skeptical, quizzical tilt of the eyebrows under the untidy hair. Then he would have to rush off. He always rushed everywhere and disappeared. But next morning, the answer to your problem would arrive in Mike's small, distinctive handwriting, two pages, often some algebra, diagrams, a key reference to the literature, sometimes an apt verse of his own composition, a fragment of Latin or classical Greek, always encouragement. We were grateful, but not grateful enough. If we had thought about it, we would have realized he must have been working on that mathematical model of my research all evening. And it isn't only for me for whom he does this. Everybody in the research group gets the same treatment, and not just his own students. I was officially Nico's student, not Mike's. Mike took me on without payment and without official recognition when my research became more mathematical than Nico could handle. When the time came for me to write my thesis, it was Mike Cullen who read it, 
criticised it, helped me polish every line. And all this while he was doing the same thing for his own official students. When, we all should have wondered, does he get time for ordinary family life? When does he get time for his own research? No wonder he so seldom published anything. No wonder he never wrote his long-awaited book on animal communication. In truth, he should have been joint author of just about every one of the hundreds of papers that came out of that research group during that golden period. In fact, his name appears on virtually none of them, except in the acknowledgments section. The worldly success of scientists is judged for promotion or honours by their published papers. Mike did not rate highly on this index. But if he had consented to add his name to his students' publications as readily as modern supervisors insist on putting their names on papers to which they contribute much less, Mike would have been a conventionally successful scientist, lauded with conventional honours. As it is, he was a brilliantly successful scientist in a far deeper and truer sense. And I think we know which kind of scientist we really admire. Oxford sadly lost him to Australia. Years later, in Melbourne, at a party for me as visiting lecturer, I was standing, probably rather stiffly, with a drink in my hand. Suddenly, a familiar figure shot into the room in a hurry as ever. The rest of us were in suits, but not this familiar figure. The years vanished away. Everything was the same. Though he must have been well into his 60s by then, he seemed still to be in his 30s. The glow of boyish enthusiasm, even the red sweater. Next day, he drove me to the coast to see his beloved penguins, stopping on the way to look at giant Australian earthworms, many feet long. We tired the sun with talking. Not, I think, about old times and old friends, and certainly not about ambition, grant getting, and papers in nature, but about new science and new ideas. It was a perfect day. The last day I saw him. We may know other scientists as intelligent as Mike Cullen, though not many. We may know other scientists who were as generous in support, though vanishingly few. But I declare we have known nobody who had so much to give, combined with so much generosity in giving it. From Oxford, I moved on to Berkeley, uh, where I spent two years as a very junior assistant professor and loved it, but was then uh, lured back to Oxford, uh, where I became a university lecturer and eventually wrote The Selfish Gene after quite a while there at Oxford. Throughout the book, I try to put, in addition to just stories about uh, my life and the people I knew, I try to put little asides, perhaps little scientific thoughts. And I want now to read a couple of them, um, which are, they really are asides. They could have come anywhere, almost. Um, the first is about, actually, the first two are about the luck that we all have in being here at all. And I introduce it in the very first part of the book where I'm talking about my ancestors, including one Clinton George Augustus Dawkins, 1808 to 71. He was the British consul in Venice, and he was there during a, a war against Austria. I have a cannonball in my possession sitting on a plinth, bearing an inscription on a brass plate. I don't know whose is the authorial voice, and I don't know how reliable it is, but for what it is worth, here is my translation from French, then the language of diplomacy. One night when he was in bed, a cannonball penetrated the bed covers and passed between his legs, but happily did him no more than superficial damage. This narrow escape of my ancestors' vital parts <laughs> took place before he was to put them to use. <laughs> and it is tempting to attribute my own existence to a stroke of ballistic luck. A few inches closer to the fork of Shakespeare's radish and... But actually, my existence and yours and the postman's hangs from a far narrower thread of luck than that. We owe it to the precise timing and placing of everything that ever happened since the universe began. The incident of the cannonball 
is only a dramatic example of a much more general phenomenon. As I've put it before, if the second dinosaur to the left of the tall cycad tree had not happened to sneeze and thereby failed to catch the tiny shrew-like ancestor of all the mammals, we would none of us be here. We all can regard ourselves as exquisitely improbable. But here, in a triumph of hindsight, we are. And that theme of being lucky to be here, uh, I'd come back to in the very last chapter, which is called Looking Back Along the Path, in which I tried to talk about all the different things I described in my life and say, what would have happened if they'd have been a bit different, if things had happened differently? What if Alois Schickelgruber had happened to sneeze at a particular moment rather than some other particular moment during any year before mid-1888 when his son, Adolf Hitler, was conceived? You may know that Hitler's real surname was Schickelgruber. Heil Schickelgruber doesn't have the same ring, does it? Obviously, I have not the faintest idea of the exact sequence of events involved, and there are surely no historical records of Herr Schickelgruber's stern mutations, but I am confident that a change as trivial as a sneeze in, say, 1858 would have been more than enough to alter the course of history. The evil omen sperm that engendered Adolf Hitler was one of countless billions produced during his father's life, and the same goes for his two grandfathers, four great-grandfathers, and so on back. It is not only plausible, but I think certain, that a sneeze many years before Hitler's conception would have had knock-on effects sufficient to derail the trivial circumstance that one particular sperm met one particular egg, thereby changing the entire course of the 20th century, including my existence. Of course, I'm not denying that something like the Second World War might well have happened even without Hitler, nor am I saying that Hitler's evil madness was inevitably ordained by his genes. With a different upbringing, Hitler might have turned out good, or at least uninfluential. But certainly his very existence and the war, as it turned out, depended upon the fortunate, well, unfortunate, happenstance of a particular sperm's luck. And I end that with a poem from Aldous Huxley. A million, million spermatozoa, all of them alive, out of their cataclysm, but one poor Noah dare hope to survive. And of that billion minus one might have been Shakespeare, another Newton, a new Dunn. But the one was me. Shame to have ousted your betters thus, taking ark while the others remained outside. Better for all of us, froward homunculus, if you'd quietly died. Well, I was told to stop at... Uh, 1.30, so I think maybe I'll stop and take questions at that, at that point. Would that be a good idea? So I, that's a very interesting thought. I've had that thought of the incredible improbability of, of my own existence. Uh, so I wonder what your thought is on the incredible improbability of our universe having a standard model with these 50 or so constants, which is so precisely what they need to be to allow for a universe that encodes information which is enabling uh, property for evolution to yes. be at all possible. Yes, it's a very interesting point. I, I mean, not all physicists accept that argument. Uh, Victor Stenger, for example, says that, that actually the, the alleged improbability of the universe is less than many people think. Um, but assuming that, that, it, that it's right and that we have these 15 knobs that each one represents a fundamental constant, and if any one of those knobs had been tuned ever so slightly different, um, the, the universe as we know it would not have been possible. Uh, s galaxies would not have formed, perhaps stars would not have formed, therefore the elements would not have formed, therefore chemistry wasn't possible, therefore life wouldn't have been possible, and so on. So there's a temptation to see the universe as a put-up job uh, and to see a divine creator as a divine knob twiddler who Ex who twiddle these knobs to exactly the right value in order to foreshadow, foreordain uh, life, perhaps even human life. Um, 
I find that a, a, a deeply unsatisfying idea because, of course, it leaves totally unexplained the divine knob twiddler himself. It's, you, you need exactly the same problem. If you could magic him into existence, you might as well just magic the, the fine tuning into existence. Other physicists have, have resorted to a multiverse theory where they propose that this universe, our visible universe, is only one of a bubbling foam of universes. We are in one bubble, and the other bubbles in the foam have different physical constants. So there are billions of universes in the multiverse, all with different values of the physical constants, all with different settings of the, of the knobs. And by, with, with hindsight, since we're here, we obviously had to be in one of the bubbles, however small a minority, which had the right physical constants to give rise to uh, galaxies and stars and chemistry and life. That's the anthropic principle. Uh, it's obviously a lot more satisfying than the divine knob twiddler idea. Other physicists say that the 15 knobs, or however many there are, are not free to vary anyway. There's only one way for them to be, but the standard model of physics doesn't yet tell us what that way is, and we need a better physics, which will one day tell us that the values of the fundamental constants could only be that way. Um, as Einstein put it, rather unfortunately, uh, in unfortunate language, Einstein said, what really interests me is whether God had any choice in setting up the universe. And it, what he meant, of course, was, is there only one kind of universe that it's possible to, to have? Or are there lots of alternative ways in which a universe might exist, in which case the multiverse theory works. Um, OK, I've probably said enough about that. The next question. <laughs> okay. Something I've, uh, very interesting I've noticed, I mean, th this is about uh, belief in, the, in a deity. Uh, what I've usually seen is that some of the people who are exposed to natural scientists, uh, especially through high school and college, they kind of start to understand that, uh, I mean, at least go away from faith uh, in, in a deity. It, I, interestingly, I've seen several scientists, uh, usually in abstract fields, mathematics and sometimes computer science, who actually, as they kind of grow up, they start believing in the maybe the abstract idea that is kind of similar to what they've been experiencing. I was wondering, uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? And, and w what do you have to say to, to those people? Yes. Um, some research has been done on um, fellows of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, the, the elite scientists of the United States, and the equivalent elite scientists of the, of, of the British Commonwealth, the, the Royal Society. Uh, and b these two independent studies have both come up with the same result, that about 90% of these elite scientists are non-believers. About 10% have some kind of religious belief. And within the, that 10%, uh, uh, there is a slightly greater tendency for physical scientists and mathematical scientists to be believers than for biological scientists, to which, which agrees with the, the observation that you've just made. Um, quite often, when you meet a religious scientist, it's worth asking what he really does believe. It often turns out to be a kind of Einsteinian religion, where, I mean, Einstein did not believe in a personal God. Einstein uh, used the language of religion, used the language of God to refer to that which we don't yet understand. And he had a deep and fitting reverence for that which we don't understand. And I think many of us would agree that we feel, some might call it spiritual, uh, when we think about the enormous amount that we don't yet know, the, the deep mysteries of existence, the deep mysteries of the universe. But that's hugely different from believing in a personal God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, the God of Muhammad. Um, and I think it's actually, it does a disservice to use the same language for those, those two things. As to why biologists should be slightly more likely to be non-religious than physicists, I think that might come from the fact that Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is deeply anti-design in the sense of, de of deliberate design uh, by a creative intelligence. If you think about it, what the great achievement of Darwin was to show that we don't need a creative intelligence. What Darwin showed is that entities complicated enough to be creative designers, things like the human brain. The human brain's perhaps the only one we know. Entities complex enough to do that 
don't suddenly get magicked into existence. They come about through a very slow, gradual process, exactly like the carving out of the Grand Canyon, as, as uh, Ray Kurzweil said. So biologists are predisposed to be hostile to uh, any attempt to smuggle in an intelligence by magic. Because we know how intelligence comes about. We know how it comes about that brains exist, which are capable of designing planes and cameras and computers. Uh, so that may be why there's a slightly greater bias. But, but all scientists in the, in, of these two elite groups, the Royal Society and the National Academy, um, uh, only about 10% are religious. And even they, one wonders whether they're religious in the Einsteinian sense rather than the personal God sense. Hi, you've done all kinds of great work, so I'm sorry to follow up a religion question with another religion question, but um, that's it, how They it usually works. are, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, this might be a gross oversimplification or me, perhaps even um, a misinterpretation of your work, but something that struck me as one of the arguments in the God delusion is sort of we can, as biological entities, re uh, but conscious ones, realize you know, maybe the pull towards religion uh, and how that affects us and choose to not follow that. And I'm wondering how you would compare that with other things that might be a part of our nature, sort of chemically and physically as biological beings, what that means to how we react to other things in addition to religion, such as sexual desire or love and other aspects that might be considered better. Right, I, I think I may have got the question. The, things like sexual desire um, are built into us by natural selection uh, for reasons we can clearly understand. I mean, obviously, Natural selection is all about the survival of genes, and genes get passed on by reproduction, and we need sex for reproduction. And so we have rules of thumb in our brain which make us lust after the opposite sex. Um, other things like religion might come from something a bit analogous to that. Um, for example, um, I, mean, I, d I don't think religion has a direct genetic survival value in the way that sexual lust does. Um, but uh, perhaps another way to put it would be that there are psychological predispositions which, under the right cultural circumstances, manifest themselves as religion. Um, and I suppose you could say, in, in a way, that sexual lust, under the right cultural conditions, manifests itself as great poetry like Romeo and Juliet. Um, so it's not all that different. The kind of psychological predisposition I'm thinking of is, well, because we're very social animals, uh, we have a natural tendency to uh, calculate debts to others, things that we owe um, to others because, of, because reciprocation is so important for good Darwinian reasons. And so we, we are aware of who owes us what. We are aware of whom we owe things to. And when something really good happens, we swim so much in a sea of other people that we naturally think we need to thank somebody, because so much of what happens to us is because of social interactions. And so we feel a need to thank. And often there really is somebody to thank. Often it really is another person who is responsible for the good thing that's happened to us. And so we thank them. But when there's no other person to be responsible for, to, to, be, to, be, to be grateful to. If, say, the weather turns out nice for our barbecue, um, take a trivial example, we still feel the impulse to thank. But there's nobody to thank. I mean, nobody actually caused the weather to be nice. So you thank God. Um, so maybe that's a, a, a small component of the um, psychological predisposition that led to religion. Another one might be the tendency for children to obey and believe their parents. Uh, in the wild state, a child is extremely vulnerable to being killed for, to, by accident and by foolishness. And so a child brain might be naturally selected, comes into the world pre-programmed with a rule, whatever else you do, believe what your parents tell you. If they tell you not to go too close to the cliff, don't ask questions, just obey. If they tell you, um, not to pick up a snake. Don't ask questions. Don't, don't obey the sort of scientific curiosity impulse. Just obey your parents. Don't touch that snake. Well, if the child brain is pre-programmed with that rule of thumb, obey and believe your parents, it has no means of 
distinguishing between good advice, like don't touch the snake, and bad or at least time-wasting advice, like perform a sacrifice at the time of the full moon, uh, or pray five times a day facing the east. Um, how could the child know which is good advice and which is bad? If it knew, it wouldn't need the advice. It would just, it would just know. So the child brain is pre-programmed, just as a computer is, is built to obey whatever instructions it's given in its own machine language. And that's why computers are vulnerable to computer viruses. A computer doesn't have any filter that says the instructions I'm now being given are evil instructions designed to wipe somebody's hard disk and destroy their doctoral thesis. Um, <laughs> why do people do that, by the way? Can you imagine? Um, the, the, the computer is simply built to obey whatever instructions it's given in the appropriate machine language. And that's why it's vulnerable to computer viruses. And so another way to put what I've just suggested is that religions are computer viruses, the, the mind, <laughs> mind viruses. Um, I guess just to be blunt about it, to go forward, to follow that analogy, sort of why is uh, following those predispositions towards religion sort of bad? I get that impression from, you know, oh. as opposed to following, say, love, which might be another biological process that we follow, yes. why is that? Oh, no, I didn't mean to say it's bad. Um, it, could be, it could be good. And I mean, I, I, it, I'm not sure how widely it's done, but it has been suggested that computer viruses too could be good. That, that you could, that, that somehow, somehow if, it, if it comes from anywhere, it probably come from Google, actually. That, uh, um, <laughs> the, the, the idea that you could use the, 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 the principle of a program that spreads itself because it spreads, because it spreads, because it spreads, because it contains the instruction, spread me around the internet. Um, it could be benign. I mean, you could, you could spread a good, a good mind virus, a good, a good computer virus. So there's, no, there's nothing that says that, that the analogy to computer viruses has to be, has to be bad, but um, it could be. And in, in, in some cases, I think it, it probably is. At, at, at best, some of them might be time-wasting. I mean, it is an awful waste of time spending hours on your knees praying to some non-existent spook. I, of course, have another question on, on atheism and religion. Um, <laughs> So my question, um, organized religion, of course, has a long history of uh, sexism. And you might expect atheism to do better in this regard. Um, and I, I think it's true that it does. But organized atheism also has um, had several incidents um, with male-dominated events, both in terms of audience and in terms of people speaking, um, and also major incidents, both at conferences and, and in online discussions. And you yourself have been criticized in this regard. And I'm wondering, is there something, some reason that atheism falls victim to the same traps as um, well, sexism? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a very unfortunate thing that, that, that many institutions fall victim to. And it would be quite surprising if atheist conferences and atheist organizations were completely immune to it. My, my sense, better? sorry? Is there some way we could do better, something that event organizers? Yes, I mean, I think, I think we all need to, need to do better. I think it's pretty clear that, that, um, that there's nothing particularly bad about this in the, in the atheist world. Uh, but there is a need to do, to do better, certainly. Yes, I agree. Is there some way we could do better? Like <laughs> something we could do differently, maybe? Um, well, I mean, treat all human beings as of equal worth and don't look down upon 50% of the population because they happen to have different genitals. So I don't have a question about religion. Um, um, uh, in your book, uh, you were reflecting on a bunch of different memories, one of them of somebody who has passed. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share a memory about somebody else who has passed, uh, Christopher Hitchens. Is there any favorite memory that you might find uh, useful to share with us? I think he was, I mean, I, I, was, I was a friend of his, but only in, in his later life. I, I wasn't one of the early coterie of friends like uh, Martin Amis and Salman Rushdie and Ian McEwan. Um, so I only met him, I think, uh, after 2006 when, uh, we, but we, we both published books at around the same time on a, on a similar theme. Um, he was, I think, the most um, spellbinding orator I ever heard. He was a magnificent speaker, a beautiful resonant voice, 
uh, superbly resourceful with what must have been something close to a photographic memory, able to pull out examples uh, with great speed and to uh, best anybody in debate. Um, I once wrote a puff uh, for him which said something like, um, if you are a religious apologist invited to have a debate with Christopher Hitchens, decline. <laughs> Um, he was a warm, friendly man. Uh, he didn't suffer fools gladly, but he was patient as well. Uh, I had enormous admiration for him. I disagreed with him on certain things. I disagreed with him over the Iraq war, for example. He was impossible to typecast on a sort of standard left-right continuum. He was his own man uh, in, in that, as in, as in so much else. His approach to atheism was, came from a slightly different direction than mine. Mine is more scientific. So for me, what really matters is the truth about the universe and uh, um, the God hypothesis. It seems to me to be an alternative hypothesis about the nature of the universe and its origins, uh, which, is, which is, I think, clearly false. And so for me, it's a scientific battle. Um, for Christopher, I think it was more a political one. I think he saw, uh, he saw religions as political organizations, and he saw, uh, he saw God as a sort of divine dictator, um, and he saw uh, the kingdom of God as a kind of divine North Korea. <laughs> I was uh, looking at some of your personal details earlier and was uh, surprised to see that you're married to the best Doctor Who companion ever. Yeah, yeah. And yes. I'd like to know, are you a big fan of Doctor Who? Well, I became a, good, a, a big fan of Doctor Who only after I met her, actually. I'm ashamed to admit. Um, I had never, I, I'd heard of Doctor Who, but I'd never actually watched any of the episodes. And then um, after we married, I did um, watch, um, not DVDs, and it was, um, what do you call them, T tapes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and I did become a fan of those tapes. I, I loved them, not least, actually, because in her time, which was uh, the, the Tom Baker era, who many people regard as the definitive doctor as well, um, the script was written by Douglas Adams and was consequently witty, satirical, and appreciated on different... I mean, it, it was a children's program, and it appreciated m much by children, but also... Uh, there was a, a witty irony um, which was appreciated by adults as well. And that's got Douglas Adams written all over it. And um, you can appreciate Douglas's episodes of Doctor Who, which included uh, the, the Tom Baker and Lala Ward uh, times, as beautiful satire of the same kind of satire as he, as he was to use also in The Hitchhiker's Guide and in his uh, Dirk Gently uh, series. So making science into comedy, laughing at, in a sort of genial, benevolent, satirical way, scientific ideas, uh, and satirizing contemporary life was something that he did supremely well. And that got into Doctor Who at that time. Hi. I, um, I personally believe in a that we live in a universe which is governed by physical laws, that it's not necessary to have uh, <clears throat> spirits or anything like that. Um, I, I understand that um, other people, their behavior um, may uh, be explainable using physical processes and that, that, that I should apply that to myself also. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm struggling at the moment with um, with where does this kind of sensation come from, my consciousness, my awareness of myself. Um, and uh, I don't really have an answer for that at the moment, so I wonder if you could help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ditto, ditto, ditto. I, I, um, I, um, I am uh, as mystified as you. I feel exactly the same way. Uh, I am aware that my brain is the product of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, uh, and it is a machine, it's, a, it's an onboard computer that helped my ancestors to survive 
on the African plains in the Pleistocene and before. Uh, and somehow, an emergent property of that large brain is the feeling of subjective consciousness, which makes me know that I'm me and not you, makes me believe that you have a personality and you have a consciousness which is similar to mine, but I can never actually get inside your mind, nor can you get inside mine. Um, that doesn't make you a solipsist. It's the exact opposite, of course. A solipsist is someone who thinks that he's the only person that there is, and everybody else is, as it were, part of his dream. Um, there was a nice story by Bertrand Russell that he had a letter from a lady who said, Dear Lord Russell, I'm delighted to hear that you are a solipsist. There are so few of us around these days. <laughs> um, I suppose that you and people like you and people like you and me have to be um, have to have to think that something about making a brain which is good at navigating through the world in a versatile way, coping with all sorts of different things that happen. Uh, not moving through a stereotype world like some um, computer programs which can only navigate through a world of colored bricks on a table or something of that sort. We have to navigate through a very versatile world. Above all, we have to navigate through a world in which the dominant things that, that, that we see, that we encounter, are other people like ourselves. We have to interact with sexual partners, with business rivals, with business companions, with co-workers, with possible enemies, with children, with, with... We have to, all the time, we're surrounded by people and we have to interact with them. Um, I suppose you could say that it... Something about needing to interact with other people might facilitate the setting up of a model in the head. We all have models in the head of the world in which we, in which we move. I mean, we, when, when we see something, what we're doing is constructing a model in the head of that something. And you can show this with visual illusions. Um, when you construct a similar model of the other people you're having to deal with, and you have to put yourself in their place, maybe something about the model of other people that you have to make necessitates the generation of subjective consciousness. But that's, that doesn't really do it, does it? Um, uh, that's sort of based on an idea of Nicholas Humphrey. Um, Daniel Dennett has more um, advanced ideas in his book, Consciousness Explained. And um, I, I think I'd better not go on too much about that, but, but, but you could look at Consciousness Explained and see if, if that does it for you. Um, various other people are attempting to do it. I sort of feel it's one of those things that maybe one day it'll seem awfully obvious, and how, how could we be so stupid as not to realize? But at present, it does seem to be a deep mystery. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I read this big footnote to the selfish gene, and one of my, of my out, mm, takeaways from it is that it's really not about being selfish. It's like I was absolutely uplifted by how much cooperation helps people. and. Uh, Mm, somehow, like this re reasoning in this book, kind of flipped me over. So, my plea would be: Could you write more articles with maybe better, catchier titles? <laughs> <laughs> and, and my uh, suggestion would be: I don't know whom to attribute it, but I love this one: "Snuggle for Survival." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Yes, I mean it, you're absolutely right that the that the. The central message of the selfish gene is not that we are selfish, still less is it that we should be selfish. It's actually mostly a book about altruism, uh, snuggling, if you wish to put it that way. Um, and um, it is true that that title, I think most of my other titles have been okay, actually. Uh, the Blind Watchmaker, um, Unweaving the Rainbow, Climbing Mount Improbable, uh, and so on. Um, I did show a, a, an early pair of chapters to a, a well-known London publisher before I gave it the title Selfish Gene. He said, you can't call it the Selfish Gene. It's a down word. Selfish is a down word. Call it the Immortal Gene. And that would have been good, I think, because it does also convey another aspect of it. The reason why natural selection can be said to work at the level of the gene is that genes are immortal or potentially immortal. And therefore, in terms of, in the long-term survival of genes is what really matters. And if they were not potentially immortal, it wouldn't matter which ones survived and which ones didn't. So the immortal gene 
It's a phrase I use in the book, and that possibly would have been better. I also suggested in the book that it could have been called the slightly selfish big bit of chromosome and the even more selfish little bit of chromosome. <laughs> let, let me ask you to uh, actually follow up on, on this last question. Uh, you describe religion as a set of mind viruses. Another word for mind virus is meme, which is uh, your, I think, very apt word. Uh, and some of those memes could be bad or good. And I think one of the good memes from religion uh, is the golden rule, which is a synonym for altruism, which you just alluded to. And you had a very interesting thesis in The Selfish Gene about how altruism uh, originates or evolves in nature. So maybe you could sum up uh, by sharing uh, your view of how altruism yes, evolves. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, the, the golden rule, of course, is terribly important. I, I think it would be unfair to attribute it to religion. It's true that many of the great religions have adopted it, but I think it actually does have older roots than that, and that's really what you're asking about, which is the evolutionary roots of the golden rule, do as you would be done by, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, Altruism has two main evolutionary roots. One is that. One is reciprocation. One is the, uh, the survival value of doing good turns, because others may then do good turns to you. And the mathematical theory of that, the best way to, to approach it, is the mathematical theory of games. And the theory has been well worked out, and it does indeed work in an evolutionary context. And a lot of the selfish gene is actually about the game theory of uh, of, um, well, game theory generally, including aggression and reciprocation. The other main source of altruism is kinship. Uh, it's easy to see nowadays, it wasn't originally, but nowadays we can see that any gene that, pers that makes an individual animal behave altruistically towards genetic relatives has other things being equal, a good chance of propagating itself because those genetic relatives statistically are likely to contain copies of the same gene. And so anyone can see that that's true for offspring. Uh, what W.D. Hamilton showed was that it's also true of, co of collateral kin, like nephews and nieces and cousins and, and siblings. Well, humans probably uh, spent a large part of their ancestral life in small bands, perhaps rather like baboons, in which they were surrounded by a group, a, a clan, who would have been mostly cousins, mostly relatives, and therefore there would have been a genetic kinship pressure to be altruistic towards everybody in your band, which is pretty much meant everybody you ever meet. And at the same time, since you meet the same people over and over again in your band, you're going to meet them again and again throughout your life. That is perfect raw material for reciprocation. It's perfect conditions for the evolution of reciprocation, reciprocal altruism, the, uh, the golden rule in one, in one way of putting it. So the fact that humans went around in limited bands, clans, fostered altruism in, the, in these two different ways and provided what could be called a lust to be nice, which was analogous to the lust for sex. The lust for sex worked because it, before the days of contraception, sex tended to be followed by babies. Nowadays, sex very often is not followed by babies because we, we're all wise to contraception. And so we still enjoy sex, even though we know perfectly well cognitively that we've separated it, we've dissociated it, from its Darwinian function. But we still have the lust, and why on earth shouldn't we? Because the lust was built into our brains at a time when contraception had not been invented. Natural selection doesn't have cognitive wisdom. Natural selection simply builds in clockwork rules of thumb. The lust for sex is just such a clockwork rule. And the lust, for, the lust to be nice is also, because it evolved at a time when we did live in small groups, Nowadays, we don't live in small groups. We live in large cities where we are not surrounded by cousins, and we're not surrounded by people we're going to meet again and again in our lives. We're surrounded by perfect strangers. But the lust to be nice is still there, just as the lust for sex is, th is still there. The lust to be nice still works. We still feel empathy towards somebody in distress. We still feel we want to do a good turn to people who is neither related to us nor in a position to 
uh, give the good turn back. But, it, but it's there. And we, and we feel it. It's extremely powerful emotion. Um, there are a few people, we call them psychopaths, who don't have it. But most of us do have it. Most of us do have empathy. Most of us do have pity for people in misfortune. Most of us give to charity, uh, and so on. So I think that that would be my attempt at a Darwinian explanation for the origin of altruism. And it becomes, of course, much more sophisticated due to uh, cultural evolution, which you can, if you wish, interpret in terms of memes. Not everybody does. Thank you very much. Thank you.